What did Papyrus say the first time he served spaghetti to Frisk? Bon appetit! Eh? Speaking of puns, why does Sans love puns so much? Oh, I know. It must be because he finds them humorous. No, no need to show me the door. I'll see myself out, thanks. Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where don't worry, I'm not gonna stay on camera nearly as long this episode. I just wanted to pop on real quick at the beginning here to say thank you. Thank you for the incredible support that you guys gave me during the last episode. Part one of this Undertale series was incredibly intimidating to put up because it was so personal, and it had me unloading so much emotional baggage that I've been carrying around for almost a year. The outpouring of support that came in in the aftermath of that video, in the comments, on social media, on Twitter, it was overwhelming. So thank you guys. Thank you so much for being there for the last six years and for being there on a video that I was really nervous about. Even more than that, the people I want to thank the most are the haters on those original videos who went into the comments and on Twitter and apologized for some of the comments that they made. I know that we live in a day and age where people are afraid to be wrong. And so to actually go out and say that you were sorry for comments that you made was incredibly brave. Thank you for that. And thank you for being an inspiration to the internet as a whole. We could all use a little bit more of that. So anyway, just wanted to say thank you a whole bunch. This is a really long episode with a lot of information, so I'm gonna get off camera now and go back to voiceover land. Gotta hop back into the closet. So thank you, and enjoy Undertale Part 2. Let's talk Gaster. The missing royal scientist who created the core, fell into his creation, and was shattered across time and space. Last time, we learned about the Gaster followers, fun values, the idea of parallel timelines, the space and time manipulation of Flowey and Sands, and the connection to their weapons, the Gaster Blaster for Sands, and the Hyper Goner Timeline Destroyer for Flowey. Also, real quick, I didn't bring it up last time, but Hyper Goner? It's a weird name for that weapon, right? Weirder still, though, is that it shares its name with Goner, kid. One of those monsters who's always associated associated with Gaster. Coincidence? Maybe, but I think it really supports the idea that Goner Kid, like Gaster, is someone who has been wiped clean from across the timelines. But that was all last time. Having now laid the groundwork for this entire theory, it's time to get into the nitty gritty with some details that I guarantee that you haven't heard anywhere else and that I also guarantee will blow your mind about this game. But to begin, we have to start with perhaps the darkest area in all of Undertale, the True Lab. It's an area of the game that you can only access if you're doing a true pacifist playthrough, and inside are some of the darkest secrets from the entire game. According to the entries found in the computer screens throughout the lab, Elfies, the royal scientist after Gaster, experimented with injecting determination, defined as the will to keep living and the resolve to change fate, into comatose monster bodies in an attempt to create souls strong enough to break the barrier keeping the monsters trapped in the underground. Of course, it turns out that the soul itself has to already be strong, and since all the souls of all the monsters in the underground added together don't even amount to the strength of one human soul, the results of these experiments are downright terrifying. Instead of creating stronger monster souls, these experiments yielded horrific monsters melted together, fused bodies that turned into shambling creatures called amalgamates. And if that wasn't bad enough during these experiments, Alfie's not only injected monsters with determination, but also injected a tiny yellow flower. Hmm. Wonder if that was a good idea. <laughs> And thus, the main antagonist of the entire freaking game was born. GG, science. GG. Now, most of you watching probably already know that story. You're actually expected to piece it together bit by bit from numbered lab entries scattered throughout that area of the game. But only the truly astute players will notice that one number is missing. Entry 17. Is this just an error by Toby Fox? Did you lose count, buddy? 14 teen, 15, 16, 18, 19, 20? What do you say? Nope. If you edit the game files manually and set your location to room number 264, an otherwise inaccessible room in the game, you find contained inside entry 17. And what it says is bone chilling. Unlike all the others, this entry is written in the font of Wingdings. And if you translate those random symbols into English, it says the following. Quote, entry number 17, dark 
darker yet darker. The darkness keeps growing, the shadows cutting deeper, photon readings negative. This next experiment seems very, very interesting. What do you two think? What we have just read is Gaster's final letter. But how do we know? Well, the entry is written in the font Wingdings. Definitely not one you see people dipping into all that often. And at this point, it's widely accepted that the WD in WD Gaster's name is meant to stand for the font Wingdings, just like Sans is Comic Sans and Papyrus is Papyrus. This explanation would also account for the whole man who speaks in hands bit from the boat keeper. Wingdings is the only font ridiculous enough to have actual hands as letters. But more on that one later. What I want to note first is that this entry reveals what happened to Gaster. Based on the Gaster follower dialogue we covered last time, we know that he fell into, quote, his creation. But it's not specified that his creation is necessarily the core. In fact, I would hazard to say that it's not. What Entry 17 tells us is that Gaster, not Alfie's, created the Determination Extractor and then tested it on himself. Now, don't get me wrong. What we actually see in in game was the result of Alfie's work, but she based a lot of her research on the work of Gaster. How do we know? Well, Alfie's mentions blueprints in Lab Entry 5, but she does so in a way that doesn't lead me to believe that she actually created those blueprints. The exact entry reads, I've done it. Using the blueprints, I've extracted it from the human souls. I believe this is what gives their souls the strength to persist after death. Determination. Look at the phrasing here. She didn't say her blueprints were. She didn't say her device or her research, just the blueprints, which implies to me that they were just laying around. And indeed they were. You can actually find them in a secret lab behind Sans and Papyrus's house. There, on the table, blueprints for a mysterious machine, written in symbols. Symbols? Or wingdings, perhaps. Not only this, but look at the device she ends up building from these blueprints. The determination extractor looks a whole lot like an animal skull. The same skull-like shape of the gaster black Gaster and the Hyper Goner, Gaster's signature shape. But lastly on this topic, just look at the Mystery Man sprite. The design is droopy, slightly melted, just like the other monsters Elfie's infused with determination, the Amalgamates, and just like Undyne before her death, who melts because she's too determined for her own good. Determination melts monsters, thus the melted sprite of Mystery Man seems to imply that Gaster himself fused his body with excessive amounts of determination. But let's hop back to entry 17. Look at the language here. The darkness keeps growing, the shadows cutting deeper. Cutting. This reads not like a room that's slowly losing light, but rather like a man who's being broken apart, losing control of himself and his identity. And as we discussed last time, Gaster's followers confirm that he was indeed shattered across time and space in the aftermath of his experiment. So now that we have a fairly strong suspicion about what happened to him, is that it? Where is he now? Have we solved the mystery of W.D. Gaster? No, not yet. Because I'm about to convince you that W.D. Gaster is Sans. Mind blown? Well, get ready because I'm not done. W.D. Gaster is also Papyrus. My theory is that in being shattered, half of Gaster's brain got infused into Sans, and the other half went to Papyrus. Now, I already know that you're gonna start drawing parallels to the over-the-top claim that Sans is Ness. And yeah, I am saying that Sans is Gaster, so start the memes, go ahead, go for it. But keep an open mind, because I have a ton, a ton of evidence supporting this idea, and I'm gonna hit you with one hard piece of evidence right off the bat since I know winning you over on this topic is gonna be an uphill battle. So obviously Sans and Papyrus are named after fonts, and as we already discussed, it seems like Gaster is the same, being named after Wingdings. Plus, all three are skeletons, so already there's some weird connection there. But let's look again at Gaster's name. It's W.D. Gaster. Wingdings, sure, but what's this Aster part all about? Well, Aster is a font with serifs. You know, those little hooks on the ends of letters to make them more readable. It's a font that, well, not exact, closely resembles the font of Sans' Z's when he falls asleep during his genocide battle. And that, in and of itself, is a bizarre choice for a character who does everything else in a non serif font of Comic Sans. So W.D. Gaster, a skeleton-looking character with a name made up of two fonts, has pieces of him divided up into the two other skeletons who each have a single font name, and one just so happens to have text that closely resembles an Aster font. It's a lot of weird coincidences to 
account for. And if you think the idea of one creature creating two others is far-fetched, then look no further than the amalgamates. One creature made from multiple others glued together by determination experiments. Or take for instance Shirin. On the official Tumblr of Undertale, Toby Fox, in character as Sans, immediately after making a clear reference to Gaster, mentioning someone who's listening, suggests doing research about Shirin. So I did, and found a fact that most other players don't know about. The head and body of the sprite that you fight in the game are actually two different beings, but an optical illusion makes them look like they're one single creature. It's odd, isn't it, that Toby would call attention to this unless Gaster himself was a sort of illusion. One character split across several others. But let's continue since this is a pretty massive claim and I still don't expect you to be convinced yet. When asked about Papyrus and Sands, the Snowden shopkeeper explains that the Skelebros just showed up one day and asserted themselves. It's a weird origin story. They're not like the other monsters. They're different in some way. Well, them being the result of a failed experiment would explain why they just showed up one day. They literally popped into existence out of a different timeline. Need proof? Happy to provide. Look no further than the fact that Sans's song on his date and in his lab is named It's Raining Somewhere Else. That somewhere else is a different timeline, as it parallels the line Goner Kid himself says, quote, an umbrella, but it's not raining. Yeah. It's raining somewhere else. A kid from a lost timeline randomly talking about the rain? I don't think that's just a random coincidence. It's Toby's way of showing how this kid and the Gaster followers from these various timelines are all connected to the Skelebros. It would also explain Sans's strange hatred for humans. For a guy who seems so laid back about so many things, during your date with him, he gets deadly serious. He outright admits that if he hadn't made a promise to Toriel to protect your character, quote, you'd be dead where you stand. Sure, he plays it off as a joke afterward, but you just don't joke about stuff like that. And we all know Sans's no-eye pose is his serious face. But why would Sans care about a human walking around? He doesn't really seem to care about anything else except for Papyrus. Well, if he truly is a part of Gaster, who shattered while trying to replicate the powers of human determination, then that's a pretty solid reason to hate mankind. He's got a vendetta, a grudge. Sans also has a direct connection with the Royal Scientist's lab. In a patch that came after the game's release, if the player calls Papyrus twice on the top floor of the lab, he'll say that the bag of dog food in that room looks familiar, that Sans had it in his room for a while. We also see in some versions of the true pacifist ending that, in a surprise to all the characters, Elfies and Sans know each other. When Papyrus calls out this out-of-nowhere revelation, Elfies starts to get super nervous, until Sans deflects the question and everyone moves on. It's almost like the two of them are hiding something. But here's the clincher, a detail that, to my knowledge, no one has picked up yet. We've all assumed that all the lab entries, except for the one in Wingdings, were written by Alfie's as she conducts her determination experiments. But the truth is, they're not. There's another author for about half of them, and that author is Sans. Pay close attention to the text of the entries. Half are grammatically correct, with proper punctuation and capitalization. The other half are entirely in lowercase. Who else in the game not only speaks in lowercase, but according to the note in his room, is also confirmed to write in lowercase? Sans. It all seems to indicate that the what do you two think at the end of Gaster's entry number 17 refers not to Sans and Papyrus, but rather to Sans and Alfie's, who are staying silent about what happened to Gaster that day. And all of this isn't even mentioning Sans's lines about wanting to go home or go back. He says his much during his dinner date scene at the Metaton Hotel. He notices that the player must want to go home and says, buddy, I know the feeling. And in the genocide run during his boss fight, he says, look, I gave up trying to go back a long time ago. So where does he want to go back to? The surface? That's not it. In his very next line of dialogue, he says, and getting to the surface doesn't really appeal to me anymore either. Keyword there being either. He wants to go back home, but to him, home isn't a place. It's a time. A different timeline. A different state of being. It's obvious that Sans was trying to fix something for a long time and just couldn't. The thing he's trying to fix is Gaster. But perhaps Sans is the easy one to convince you of. He has weird space-bending powers and knowledge of other timelines. His room is filled with metaphysical things and he's the one with the key to the secret workshop. He openly acknowledges timelines and research about anomalies in the time-space continuum and breaks the fourth wall. But Papyrus? He exhibits none of that. How could he, the great Papyrus, be 
wrapped up in all of this? And why would I possibly say something as ballsy and specific and as extreme as their two halves of the same brain? That is me making a huge final claim for this theory. Well, that's for the final episode on this topic where we tie up all the lingering mysteries of Undertale. I've already crammed a ton of stuff into this episode to make it into a manageable length, and I don't want to rush through some of these awesome final revelations, so next time we tackle the lies of Papyrus, the neuroscience of Undertale, and how it all serves as our biggest clue to who these characters really are. But in the meantime, theorists, remember, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching. Seriously though, I'm sorry that this turned into a three-parter. It was meant purely to stop at two, but as I kept digging and writing, I kept finding more and more that I had to cover. Contrary to what many people have said, Toby Fox hid a ton of clues about this hidden storyline throughout the game, so I want to be as thorough as possible in covering it all, to do it the justice that it deserves. So don't worry, there won't be much waiting for this one, it's coming up next week. If you're interested in making sure that it hits your subscription box immediately as it comes out, make sure you ring that subscription bell by showing mercy to the annotation right here. Just like Solomon is Maylove did, who joined the notification squad, got the first comment on the first part of the Gaster video, and is now here and getting his name probably butchered by me in this voiceover. Congratulations, sir. I did my best. And with that, I'm headed off. If you're still looking for more Gaster content, I encourage you to click right here to watch where we play on the live stream Undertale Fan Hacks, specifically battles against Gaster. The gameplay of these things are incredible. It forces you to put to the test every single element of gameplay from Undertale proper in this ultimate boss battle. It is phenomenal. One of the best games that we've played on the live streams as a whole, and it's a fan game. Check out that video, check out that fan game, definitely worth your time. Now if you'll excuse me, Gaster 3 calls as well as a Fallout video. Time to do something new around these parts, yeah? So I'll see you then! Have a great week!